Welcome to the Curious Advantage podcast, an exploration of the idea of curiosity and its increasing importance for thriving in the digital age from the authors of The Curious Advantage. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Curious Advantage podcast. This series is about how individuals and organizations use the power of curiosity to drive success in their lives and businesses, especially in the context of our new digital reality. It brings to life the latest understanding from neuroscience, anthropology, history, business, and behaviorism about curiosity and makes these useful for everyone. My name is Simon Brown. I'm one of the co-authors of the book, The Curious Advantage, and the Chief Learning Officer at Novartis. And today I'm here with my co-authors, Paul Ashcroft. Hello. Garrick Jones. Hi there. And we're delighted to be joined by Spencer Harrison. Hello, everyone. Spencer is the Associate Professor of uh, Organizational Behavior at INSEAD, uh, and it's fair to say an expert on curiosity. He has a 2018 TED Talk on why curiosity is your superpower uh, and has undertaken many research studies on curiosity in a work context with companies that include NASA, Google, and including studies involving the curiosity of chief executive officers. Uh, Spencer's research has been recognised by the academic community through awards including the Informs Dissertation Award Finalist, the Academy of Management Journal Best Paper of the Year Award Finalist, the Journal of Management Best Paper Award and the Organisational Behaviour Division Best Symposium Award. Uh, his research findings have been published in top management journals including the Academy uh, of Management Journal, the Organisational Science, the Journal of Applied Psychology and the Journal of Management. Uh, also on top of his day job, he was the divisional chair of the managerial and organization cognition of the Academy of Management, and he was a co-founder of the Creativity Collaboratorium, a working group of the world's top cited creativity scholars. Uh, as well as all of that, he serves on the editorial boards of the Academy of Management Journal and the Academy of Management Discoveries. Uh, we're thrilled to have him here and uh, welcome to the Curious Advantage podcast, Spencer. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. So it's great to have you joining us, and I'm particularly excited to have you here with all of your extensive research on curiosity that I know is going to be uh, to have a lot of interest for our listeners. So uh, to kick us off, maybe we can hear from you where your original interest in curiosity started. Sure. I mean, I think I was kind of blessed to grow up in a household that encouraged curiosity. We had pretty wide ranging conversations at the dinner table that were often irreverent and humorous, but I think our parents encouraged us to explore the world, to think about things in different ways and to try new things. As a young child, I was always extremely interested in creativity, um, especially around storytelling and art. And as I grew older and was trying to kind of understand both what was influencing me and my behavior and trying to understand the behavior of the business world more broadly, I began to realize that one of the things that was kind of leading to my interest in creativity and also served as a predictor of other people's creativity was how curious they were. And that led me to want to kind of understand the science behind curiosity so that I could help other people become more curious as well. What was it that made it so fascinating to, uh, to dig in then? So what was behind that when you did to want to know more? Well, I think one of the things that was interesting is that once you kind of begin to locate something that you're fascinated by and you want to understand a little bit more, then you begin to kind of dig into the backlogs of what other people have studied about it in the past. And what became really quickly prevalent to me was that there had been very little research on curiosity, specifically in the role of business in the world of work. And for me, that just seemed like a huge open space that deserved a lot of attention. And, and so seeing that that was kind of so much, um, you know, it, it was just kind of virgin territory to explore, that really energized me to want to dig in and, and figure out how to, how to best understand this and kind of bring it to light for, for other people to appreciate. Your TED Talk was called Why Curiosity is Your Superpower, uh, which we love and would fully agree with. Why do you see curiosity as a superpower? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, I think, you know, one of the arguments that we make in the TED Talk, and, and it was sort of a bizarre TED Talk because um, I did it with the chief data officer, John Cohen, from SurveyMonkey. And part of the reason that we were brought together is that SurveyMonkey has an organizational value around curiosity. 
And uh, John knew another researcher and he connected him with, with me. And so we began working on this TED Talk, but we were, we were separated from each other the entire time. We'd actually never met face to face until um, you know, hours before we showed up on stage at this TED Talk. So it's a weird TED Talk because there's two of us and we're kind of going back and forth. Um, but one of the arguments we made there was simply that the world of work is changing in fairly radical ways, right? A lot of people are now referring to this as the fourth industrial revolution. And we're beginning to realize that, that robotics is not just automating the physical labor that we used to do, but it's automating much more fine, um, detailed sort of manual operations that humans still felt like they had a leg up on the computers with. And then in addition to that, we're doing so much with artificial intelligence and machine learning that that's beginning to overtake some of the thinking that, that we've been able to do as human beings as well. So one of the arguments that we were trying to make is that curiosity is one of these skills that allows us to differentiate ourselves from the other inventions that we're creating as a species that serve to replace us. Um, and recently I was actually, we've been doing this um, review of the last 20 years of all the empirical evidence about the impact of curiosity in the world of work. And there was a particular study that we found that referred to curiosity as what they called an investment trait. And I think that that's a really fun way of thinking about it. So the idea is that when I'm, when I'm acting curious, I'm actually investing in my intelligence. I'm kind of building that bank account so that at a later date, I'm able to use that intelligence to, to create something else or to make a different decision or something along those lines. Um, and that's one of the ways that I think that curiosity really becomes our superpower is that the more we're curious, the more we're investing in intelligence and knowledge and linking ideas together in fun ways that might not bear fruit right now, but in the long run, they are things that will differentiate us as we build that, that bank account of ideas and knowledge. It reminds me of the neuroscientists we speak to who talk about um, we pay attention to gossip uh, rather than facts because we store them up. They might be useful for us later in a, in a safety or a risk situation. So the idea that there are things that we pay attention to because we need them, which I think is what you're talking about. There's an economy almost of ideas that we bring on board because we store them up. And that I think is the same for curiosity and being curious about things that are outside our, our current context. I mean, you've conducted so many studies in Curious to over the years. Um, what are some of the other uh, most exciting and interesting findings that you guys have come up with? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the one that's kind of the most um, maybe bizarre sounding at first blush, but then makes a ton of sense once you get into it, and I think has real practical implications for bringing curiosity into the world of work is this study that we've um, recently conducted with individuals, or actually it's not individuals, it's teams of scientists that are living in Mars simulators for two week periods. So these individuals go to the desert in Israel or in Australia. In this case, the groups were in a Mars habitat in the Western desert of Utah. And once they are kind of dropped off, there are these domes out in the desert, they're in the middle of nowhere. And they, they role play as though they're on Mars for the next two weeks. So they'll wake up in the morning and if they need to go outside, they have to sit in a decompression chamber for 10 minutes and they put on a helmet and a spacesuit, and they walk outside. And one of the great things that, that these uh, teams did that, that for me just kind of um, reminds me of all these sort of Star Trek episodes is they would keep these daily logs of what was going on and what they were experiencing in part because they're thinking about you know, in the future, when, when humans actually do reach Mars, maybe they can look back on this or, or maybe like our day to day life and us kind of dealing with the pressures of, of living in this sort of simulation can carry over into what that looks like. So they were kind of keeping these logs for the benefit of science. And as a, as a good scientist, I hope um, we, we began reading these just because they were publicly available on the Internet. And I just thought this is fascinating. It's sort of like Captain Kirk from Star Trek, right? Like, you know, most of those episodes would begin with him talking into a microphone, like Captain's Log, Star Date, X, Y, Z. And then he begins kind of talking about what had happened. Mm. So what we did is we, um, we actually used linguistic text analysis. And we looked at the Captain's Logs. And we operationalized curiosity in a, in a pretty simple way. So what we said is, curious people tend to ask lots of questions. So we're going we're gonna to calculate your curiosity as a leader based on how many times you use question marks in your log. 
And we're going to use exclamation points because curious people tend to look for surprises or are willing to be surprised themselves. And then because everybody else on their team is keeping a daily log as well, we would look at the next day's log of the team members and we would look for indicators that people had done something creative. Hmm. So words like invent, discover, create, new, novel, distinct, different. And what we found was for every, stand, every standard deviation increase in question marks and exclamation points on the leader the night before, it leads to a standard deviation increase in creativity on the team members on the next day. And you found that through the logs. That's amazing. Exactly. Yeah, just looking through the logs, right? So, so we could quantify like the leader's curiosity just by what they were writing. And, and in that case, we're just looking at punctuation. Yeah. But then we can look at the descriptions of the team members the next day. And so as a leader, when you're kind of cultivating that curiosity and reflecting on, on questions, it has a carryover effect the next day for your team members. And obviously, that's going to that's gonna happen through conversation and through interaction that we aren't able to see because – that's not captured in the logs. But but you do see, you know, mundane things like people fixing the composting toilet or, you know, scrapping together some leftover cans of food to make something that tastes ex- extremely well. Or it could be somebody like going out the next day and, and you know, this, this was the day that they finally made a geologic breakthrough or they got their robotic um, drone m- equipment to work. So, I mean, you would see all these things from like very mundane creativity that just makes life a little bit better on the margins to these sort of um, scientific breakthroughs that were happening in the teams. That's fascinating. I mean, it's not only fascinating in terms of the research that discovers there's an impact from the kind of questions you can ask as a leader, but it also, to me, triggers some of the work that needs to be done on how do you value curiosity within a system or value curiosity within the organization. I think that's that's brilliant. I can't wait to read that research. You talk about AI and you talk about other digital realities. Um, if you flip that on its head, do you think that curiosity or what's your view on curiosity with now within the digital world that we are all inhabiting? I think curiosity happens in a couple of different ways there. And, and some are really wonderful and and provide optimism for the future and some are a little bit darker and you know might provide some pessimism so if i start with the dark side first um there there have been some sociologists that have noted that we live in an age where we're kind of chronically curious in the sense that all of us have you know our little smartphones in our pockets and they are programmed to notify us about a, a variety of different things depending on what apps we have downloaded and so we can we can be perpetually curious about what's happening in my social network, what's happening in my professional network. Have I just received an email? And in that sense, it, we can be curious about so many different things and be getting these notifications so so chronically that it doesn't allow us to actually focus in on other things where we can be gaining and kind of adding additional knowledge, which kind of just constantly skimming the surface of these other things. You're talking about it, it sort of creates a narrow bandwidth for us. Yeah. We talk a bit about that in the in the book, actually, of how um, curiosity with all, all of those distractions almost can be um, aimlessly following the path of YouTube videos and notifications and whatever, and, and actually having that focused curiosity on being conscious around what it is that you're curious about. And then it's where our seven C's model in the book sort of gives some structure that you can then channel the curiosity into something meaningful meaningful versus just yeah whiling away hours um in being curious on something that actually doesn't matter exactly yep exactly and i think i think that that channeling is going to be one of these skills that's kind of key to differentiating when curiosity has this dark side and when it has this negative side um so i I mean i think that that's that's a wonderful way of putting it simon I know you did a, a study that work, looked at 500 CEOs and also top management teams. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that and uh, what you were able to find out. Yeah, so we, we invented this um, measure that we called the Curiosity Assessment Test. And I know that there's some redundancy between an assessment and a test, but we were strictly just trying to get something that we could call the cat um, mm. as a playoff <laughs> of the curiosity killing the cat. Um <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have this cat questionnaire that's actually designed specifically for business individuals. So there, there are a number of different ways of measuring curiosity, and I've used a variety of them, and, and they all work in terms of the psychology. But what was kind of missing for us was 
a, a set of scales that was really based at, on the world of work and what working adults would experience in their day-to-day -day life trying to be curious and how the system would support or not support that. And we spent the, the beginnings of the pandemic actually working on this. We kind of felt everybody's locked down. This is kind of a good opportunity for us to lock ourselves down intellectually and focus on, on getting this made. And so we began with uh, thousands of descriptions from working adults around what was a moment when they felt curious and was productive and a moment when they felt curious and was unproductive. And this gets back to the channeling that you were talking about. And what we found was that when people were really productive at work, it was really about them kind of starting with some version of the question, how can I do this better? Is there a better way? Is there some new knowledge that I can find about my world of work, right? Um, and, and what we found about unproductive curiosity was unproductive curiosity was unbound from work completely. So it was typically, you know, going back to Garrick's um, observation about gossip or um, just kind of wanting to overhear what your coworkers are doing on the other side because you can hear that there's a conversation going on. Or it was just kind of investing in um, social media or going down a rabbit hole on the Internet. And so once we had kind of built these scales, I had access to this wonderful network of uh, CEOs and organizational founders that wanted to know more about curiosity. And we had them all complete this, this CAT, this curiosity assessment test. And we asked their top management teams to complete it as well. And anybody that they had as a senior advisor or coach. And so the argument was that we were doing a sort of 360 degree review, but we were doing it in an odd way. So most 360 degree reviews would say, you know, Simon, I'm your boss. Here's how I think you're behaving. And Simon, I report to you. Here's how I think you're behaving. And so everybody's rating and providing their opinion of you. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to say, listen, these senior executives are surrounded by these individuals that are meant to influence them. And we want to understand what level of curiosity is each one of these individuals bringing to that relationship. So they were rating themselves, and then we were able to kind of score, here's what the curiosity looks all around you. Are you surrounded by top leaders that are also curious? Are you surrounded by advisors that are also curious? Um, in some of the cases, we even got their spouses. You know, is your spouse curious? And, and what impact does that have? So it's this huge data set. Um, it's a couple thousand pieces of data. But there's some really cool things that come out of that. So one of the things that was really cool and very prevalent in the data is that curiosity at the CEO level has a huge impact on the strategic organization or the strategic orientation of the overall company. And we found that both by looking at um, the, the data the CEO was providing, but also the data that the top managers was providing as well. So for example, um, we asked the top managers to describe whether or not the organization was really good at maximizing its existing resources and strategic focus, or were they exploring for new ideas and trying out new things? Now, in the strategic literature, we call this an um, exploit orientation, where you're using your existing resources, or an exploration orientation, where you're trying new things. And what research has increasingly shown over the last 20 years is that organizations need to do both. And this is what we call ambidexterity. You kind of need to take advantage of what you're already really good at and maximize that, but you need to constantly be looking for new avenues of, of you know, maximizing what you could do in the future because undoubtedly your industry is going to change and there's going to be disruption. And so what we found is if you were higher in productive curiosity as a CEO, so if you're constantly asking yourself, how can I do a better job? How can we do things differently strategically? How can I make this task better? Then your organization had higher correlations with both exploitation and exploration. You were better able to do this balancing act of ambidexterity. If you were engaged in unproductive curiosity, you actually did worse with ambidexterity. So that was kind of cool. One of the things that we also found that was associated with that is we asked the CEOs, to just free write their vision for the company for the future. And what we found is that the more you had high productive curiosity, the less you were focused on the present. So you had this kind of expansive view of what we've done in the past and what we can do in the future, but you were less focused on today. And, and so all of these things together, I think, signal that when you have really curious senior executives in your organization, 
it has good, um, you know, it, it says good things about what the organization is going to do in the future. There's a sense of you're going to be able to sustain your, your strategic um, goals that you're, you're looking for. But what I thought was kind of really fun to kind of balance that out is that we also looked at, you know, what impact did curiosity have on you individually? And, and what we found is that curiosity sustains you as an individual as well. So for these senior leaders, I mean, obviously everybody wants their time, they want their energy, they want their focus. And you can imagine that in that sort of a situation, it can become very easy to say, you know what, like, I just need a couple minutes where I can be unproductively curious. Let me just check out, check my social media, you know, check up on the sports games, engage in some gossip. And, and what people might be telling themselves when they check out like that is, I need to power down for a little bit, take a little bit of a break so that I can come back to my job with more energy. But what we actually found is when you're unproductively curious, you score higher on burnout. So there's a strong mm -hmm. correlation between those two. You're actually telling your brain, this job is killing me. I don't get energy from this. And so, you know, I'm, I'm losing energy. I'm, I'm burning out. I'm, I'm kind of beginning to think about leaving. Yeah. Uh, on the flip side, when you're productively curious as an individual, you actually score a lot higher in um, thriving and vitality. So you actually gain energy from the work that you're doing, and that sustains your sense that that you want to be there. And there's a very strong negative correlation between feeling a sense of vitality at work and and beginning to think about turning over or leaving your job and looking for another opportunity. So for me, that was kind of the most fascinating thing is that curiosity has this like very strong business case, especially for top leaders, because it has huge implications for the organization as a whole and for those individuals that are meant with kind of sustaining the direction of the organization itself. Which is, I mean, that's hugely important finding that uh, a more curious leader will actually lead to uh, potentially a more curious organization, certainly a more curious management team, and therefore a longer term, more strategic focus and, and thinking through with potentially better decisions, et cetera, that comes with it. Uh, yeah. There's one piece that you said in there, which I have to have to come back to. So you, you sure. mentioned in the data um, that you also ask spouses. So I, I need, need to ask, is it, how important is it that your spouse is curious <laughs> and, and what impact does that have? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I wish I could tell you the answer to that. That's still like a slice of the data that, that we're still getting to. Um, but one of the, the slices that I can give you that's kind of semi-related but uh -huh. doesn't get at that directly is that one of the other things that we wanted to measure was creating a culture of curiosity. And so in addition to these scales that we have where you can measure your productive curiosity and your unproductive curiosity, we also created scales so that you can describe is the environment I'm in one that encourages my curiosity or that discourages me from being curious as well? And we found something kind of fascinating there. So if you have a CEO that has very high productive curiosity, then you're less likely to say that your organization discourages your curiosity. So, so having a CEO with high productive curiosity is great because I'm not going to feel discouraged. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I feel encouraged per se, right? So it's one of those things where it's not enough for me as a CEO just to kind of be indulging my own curiosity. Like that's going to help people not feel discouraged, but that doesn't necessarily help them feel enabled. There's mm -hmm. additional things that you have to do as well. And I think that, that kind of brings us back to what I was describing with those Mars simulators is there needs to be habits and interactions that are happening, perhaps even on a daily basis that make everybody else feel like they're encouraged to be curious as well. It's not just the job of the people at the top. You're listening to The Curious Advantage podcast, inspired by the book, The Curious Advantage, written by Paul Ashcroft, Simon Brown, and Garrick Jones. Subscribe to the podcast today. And Spencer, I think it's something we're very curious about as well. At the moment, we're about to embark on a curiosity diagnosis um, with organizations around what's the impact of a curious culture in your organization, um, as you say, from not just from the leaders, but right throughout the organization. You mentioned um, earlier disruption. And of course, we are still living through huge disruption to almost every organization on the planet. Um, how do you see curiosity helping those organizations that have stayed curious in sort of these times of change and ambiguity? I mean, the example that I like to use with executives is this Italian typewriter company called Olivetti. But one of the things that I show is this newspaper clip from the late 80s 
that shows this, you know, sales curve of how many people are buying typewriters and you can just see it dropping off and plummeting. And when you think about typewriter companies, they just don't exist anymore because we don't buy typewriters. That industry was disrupted. And yet Olivetti is now a, you know, digital disruption organization that helps other organizations understand their strategies with the internet of things. And one of the things that a variety of different evidence from Olivetti's history shows is that that company was kind of chronically investing in the curiosity of the people around them. And I think that that allowed the entire organization to be flexible enough to deal with change. So as another example, um, I just did um, some work with a, a really large bank. And you can imagine that the banking industry is obviously not the typewriting industry, but they are still facing a lot of disruption nowadays in, in how that works and how we trust those institutions, cryptocurrency, all of these different things. And what we found was that the more you have people throughout your organization that feel this sense of, I can be curious, or I'm encouraged to be curious, that has a very strong correlation with their individual readiness for organizational change. So if the organization decides that the strategic direction has to move in a different way, curious people are more likely to say, hmm, how can I, how can I you know, leverage that? What do I need to understand to make that work for me? Whereas less curious people are going to say, nope, that's, that's not going to work. That makes me anxious. I don't want to explore that new way of doing things because I like the way that I'm doing things now. So I think that, that, Paul, what you're kind of hitting at that I think is really important, and I think that senior leaders can sometimes miss this, is that their job allows them to kind of look widely and to network with people outside of the organization. And, and they're enabled to be curious in a way that's very often different than people that get down to the front lines of the organization. But the more that those frontline employees feel like they can be curious as well, it'll be a different form of curiosity. It might not be like high level strategic thinking, but they can still be thinking about how can I do this job better? How can I engage in this customer better? Why is a customer leaving for this competitor? The more that they're asking those questions, the more that they are doing what we mentioned earlier, this investment trait where they're creating the mental agility that they can then pull out of their bank account later when the organization says, now we all need to change. So I, I think that that hmm. provides some evidence about why curiosity is important, not just because of sort of the immediate returns that it might provide in terms of efficiency and you know catching errors and those sorts of things, but in the long run, every organization is going to have to change at some point. And the more curious your workforce, the more able you are to adapt. I think it makes sense. You mentioned there about individuals uh, being curious no matter what level in the organization they're working at. Um, in terms of curiosity being a superpower, uh, if people are feeling that actually, hey, I'm not that curious, is this something that we can develop? Can we develop our curiosity muscle, our superpower? Sure. So the very first study that I did on curiosity in the world of work I used a sample of individuals that were making handmade products and selling them on a website that's called Etsy.com. So Etsy has wonderful products, and I would encourage anybody that wanted to find you know, a really unique gift for a loved one or for a close friend, that's a great place to go to get something that is really unique. And it, they also are kind of creating this competitive marketplace where they're competing against each other to make these sorts of things. So what I was able to do is get a group of about 300 individuals that run these their own Etsy stores to fill out a daily survey where we were capturing their curiosity on a day-to-day -day basis. And what was great about that is that we could actually tie their daily levels of curiosity over time to the performance of their stores. So we could actually show that, that curiosity has an impact on their ability to generate new products and to get customer interest and have new sales, those sorts of things. But what was really interesting, and this gets back to your question about can we develop curiosity, is that when you are able to gather um, this sort of motivational data from an individual over a period of time, it actually allows you to see how much variance there is from day to day. And so the average where somebody is at kind of tells you this is sort of our genetic predisposition to be this level of curious. And then how it varies around that is probably more likely determined by the situation that's there that's allowing them to kind of flex a muscle and learn to grow that or to reduce. 
And what we found is that, you know, depending on the sample that you're looking at, somewhere between 35 to 50 percent of your curiosity is determined by your genetic predisposition toward being curious, which means the rest is determined by how you're developing that as a skill and the situations that you're encountering that allow you to be more or less curious yourself. So almost two so thirds of it is two thirds of it. You can is something you can work on, right? That's a big chunk. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. And I think I think then the holy grail is how can we figure out as organizational leaders, people that design organizations, to think about how can we create organizations that actually allow people to grow that muscle. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really interested by what you were just saying on the, the Etsy example. So f- just to, to repeat to make sure I understood. So basically, the more curious um, the people in the shop were on any given day, the more uh, the, or the, the better the performance of that store on that day. It, it was as, as clear cut as, as that. So so we didn't have daily store data. But what uh-huh. we did is when they started taking the surveys, so like at, at day one, yeah. I went and I took a, a snapshot of all the performance data on their store. Uh-huh. And then at the end of the study, so two weeks later, I took a snapshot again of what was going on in their store. And so then we could look at their trajectories of curiosity over time or yeah. their overall average rate of curiosity. And then we could look at the change from time one to time two, and it would predict improved performance in the stores. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's huge. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Have you, um, you just to go back? You'd mentioned anxiety and people being anxious, and I was interested in you know there's a growing body of work on on anxiety, psychological safety, and how we need that in order to be curious too, and also to go further to push our boundaries. We need to have a basis of psychological safety, understand the boundaries, and be prepared through confidence to kind of go forward. Uh, have you done much work on that sort of aspect of culture within an organization? So I I definitely think that the measures that we're looking at with an organization that encourages curiosity, there is a correlation with psychological safety. Not enough to say that they're exactly the same thing, but clearly that there is a a strong positive correlation between the two. And I think that the, the research on psychological safety and the fact that organizations are really beginning to focus in on that right now is incredibly important for a variety of different reasons, um, both because it allows us to experiment and to find new information and be curious, but also because it has important wellness and health outcomes as well. I think you know a, a fun example of that, that that's related but not exactly the same is um, another study that I conducted was with t-shirt designers on a famous crowdsourcing website that's called threadless.com. So Threadless is, you know, it's an amazing organization because basically what they have is all of their customers are also their R&D department. And so you have these designers that are creating these amazing ideas for shirts. And then they're also rating the ideas that they like and saying, this is the shirt that I want to buy. And so then Etsy at any given day knows that they've got a quarter of a million of people that think this shirt's a really good shirt. Let's print it. And then within two weeks, that shirt sells out and then they come up with the next thing. So it's this great you know, innovation engine. And what we did is we looked at a forum that they had on the website called the Critique Forum, where um, designers could post a sketch of a potential design, and then they could get ratings, quantitative ratings on that design, and then also begin an interaction and get feedback from people about what what they liked. It was great. And we, yeah, and what we did is we asked the designers to fill out a survey and let us know how curious they were And then we captured the evolution of their most recent t-shirt design in this critique forum. And what you find then is that more curious individuals begin to build almost an organization below them. Because you can think, you can imagine, like I'm the designer, so I designed the t-shirt. And then each one of those t-shirts that I design, each prototype attracts individuals to give me feedback. So now I'm engaging with them and they become part of my network. And then I provide another example and then more people come in And by the time we've gone through this experience, and on average, people would post five different prototypes. So you would be able to watch the T-shirt evolve through five different drafts. Um, They would get around 50 different comments. But what we found is that the more curious designers invited more feedback. So they would end up having five times the amount of feedback. And so in a sense, what they're doing is they're creating a network of interaction within their halo of curiosity. Right. The organization, the psychological safety 
is actually being created by the way that they're asking questions yeah, and the way that they're encouraging interaction. That's fascinating. I love it. I see, I, see, yeah. I see a strong linkage there with our seven C's, actually, of that what they're doing is creating the community. They're getting a load of feedback, which they're curating down. They're, they're applying those ideas built, built on what they do, putting that into action through construction, and then they're being critical back through that community in terms of what it yeah. is. So it's this virtuous cycle that they're creating yeah. uh, in order to do it. Yeah, fascinating. That's great. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Moving on a little bit, I know you did a lot of work with Google um, around their their new joiners and maybe flipping one of the notions that we would normally hold true around uh, what happens when someone joins an organization. So could you tell us a bit more about uh, the work you did there? Sure, sure. So, um, I mean, now this is kind of eight years ago, but at the time, Google was 18,000 people and they were going to hire another 10,000 people that year. And so they knew that that kind of absorbing that size of growth within one year was going to have an impact on the organizational culture. And as somebody that early in my career, I had studied organizational onboarding in part because newcomers tend to be really curious about their organizations. And in a separate study, we had actually analyzed whether um, hiring more curious newcomers actually helps them adjust and perform better. And guess what it does? So that's great. And so, so Google was curious about, you know, how should we apply this sort of thing? Are we, are we supposed to be hiring more curious people? And through the course of the conversation, we actually came up with a, an even more fascinating research question, which is rather than thinking about how are these people going to impact our culture and how can we train them fast enough so they become like us, we flipped that question on its head to say, how can we allow these people to change our culture so that we can make sure that we're learning from them? So for me, it actually came up with this new notion. We, we typically think about onboarding people and the metaphor there is you're kind of bringing them on board so that they become like us. All the cultural equipment that we've already established gets replicated in who they're becoming. And what data shows is that you basically, you know, you lose money for the first six months of a newcomer because you invested in selecting them and in mm-hmm. training them and they're not as productive. And then eventually they begin to produce a return on the investment, you know, six months to a year later. And in this study, what we did instead is we said, how can we inboard newcomers? So what would inboarding look like as a process if we said each new person that's coming into an organization is actually a new set of knowledge and experience? And as an organization, how can we be curious about them so that they're allowing us to learn strategic insights, process insights, ways of engaging with customers that makes us a better organization? Now, it turns out, we were lucky enough that um, we were able to have several of the newcomers in the study brought some really amazing innovations to Google that are things that you probably have in your home or on your phone right now. And we were able to kind of watch those as they move through the Google ecosystem. And not surprisingly, one of the things was is that if you hire a really curious newcomer, they're both curious about the way the system works and curious about how to insert their ideas in the system. So curiosity helps them create a mental map of the way the culture operates so that they can better understand where they can insert their new ideas and make sure that those ideas connect. But the other thing that curiosity did, and this, this also ties back in with what you were saying about, you know, one of the seven C's being community and the conversation we had about the t-shirt designers is that really curious people do a good job at creating relationships, Mm. right? So if I come to you, so if I go to Garrick and I say, you know, Garrick, um, where can I find this book? And, and Garrick tells me where it is, he's probably thinking at the end of that inter- interaction, like, why did Spencer want that book? What was it he was really asking for, right? And we become sort of suspicious about the instrumental motives other people might have about our knowledge at work. But if I come to Garrick and I say, hey, Garrick, I'm really curious. Do you know where I can find information like this? All of a sudden, my willingness to express my curiosity humanizes that interaction in a pretty profound way where Garrick's like, you know what, Spencer's a fun guy to interact with because he's interacting based on curiosity. He doesn't just want something from me for the sake of it. He wants something because he's actually following his humanity as a way of connecting with my humanity. How often are people really curious about our inner lives in the world of work, right? I mean, often we kind of walk around in the hallways and we just assume Garrick's on task, Paul's on task, Simon's on task. And, And because we make that assumption, we can kind of fill in the blanks about everything else that's going on. But that moment where I can say, Garrick, I'm really curious. Tell me about 
you know, topic X. And Garrick's just like, you know, here's everything you wanted to know. And I'm walking away thinking, wow, Derek really knows a lot about that. And Derek's walking away thinking like, I just really had a great connection with Spencer. He's a good guy to have lunch with, right? And then, so so that's that's just another way to kind of build the network. And then the network becomes a way of us mapping our knowledge. I don't have to know everything Garrick knows. I just have to know what he knows. And then I can connect with him again because I'm curious and he knows that I'm curious. A curious culture is a game changer. What does curiosity mean for you? Follow hashtag Curious Advantage and join the conversation. And that's such a great illustration of the stickiness of community and what it is that attracts people. As you say, it's humanity. You know, for me, when people ask me questions, which I know things about, um, I'm a geek, right? So the idea of um, finding a, cur a curious buddy who's interested in similar things becomes something I get excited about. Uh, and then the community grows. I love that. Yeah. I'm fascinated by how much um, is lost by most organizations not thinking the way that you were describing around new joiners, because um, uh, one of the things we, we cite is, you know, one of the things that often kills curiosity is, is where someone joins an organization and it's like um, they're asking questions and, and you get the response of, you know, that's how it's done around here. Don't rock the boat, yes. you know, it's it, and and actually those are such missed opportunities for, for yeah, for, for pivoting, for adapting, for learning from from this great new insight that you're probably paying a premium to bring into the organization, but so often uh, it's viewed that the person coming in needs to learn the organization as opposed to the organization actually could learn an awful lot from the person coming in. That's fascinating, exactly. And I think one of the things that, you know, there was a sort of a phase shift that came with um, Jim Collins' Good to Great, where people, everybody began to talk about getting the right people on the bus and really beginning to invest in selection and saying, let's make sure we're really looking through all the potential candidates and picking the right candidate. But if you do all of that investment and then immediately you do like Simon's saying, and you say, that's not the way that we do things around here, then why did you invest so much in that selection? Yeah, You're basically saying, we're going to waste a lot of money up front to tell you to be exactly like us rather than we're going to invest all of this money up front because the knowledge that you're bringing with you through the door is going to be critical for us to learn. Yeah. And we're going to set up a system for us to take advantage of that. And, and, yeah. There's other evidence that suggests that um, newcomers' sense of newness, so this isn't just looking at like their performance curve, it's just how long do they actually feel new? How often, how long is it when they feel like they could walk in the hallways and say, Garrick, like, why do we do it this way? It just seems weird to me. At my old place, we did this the other way. It yeah. fades by about the six month mark, which is, you know, that's sort of the popular wisdom around that's how quickly somebody becomes an old timer. Six months. Yeah, about six months. But the danger is, is that once I have old timer eyes, once I see the world the way the insiders do, yep. all of those points of contrast and those opportunities for me to be surprised and to just just ask a question like, I'm curious, why do we do it this way? all fade away because now I just begin to accept the assumptions yep. that everybody else has around here as if that's the right way to do things rather than question them. That's such an important point. And it's and one of the things that triggers for us is, is our, our 7C around criticality and trying to teach ourselves and people and the next generation who all virtually engaged um, about unconscious bias and all the other biases that we bring from our experience and our you know environment and whatever how do you enable yourself to be curious and also be able to reflect and step back and say well how do i make sure that i'm not applying filters that that uh, lead me down a path that just simply confirms what i want to know or how do i apply a filter which allows me to go somewhere that is a little bit more dangerous for me, or I might, you know, feel that I need to learn something about. And it's that idea of, of keeping things open when, when you bring new people in, keeping the, the environment and the organization open by learning from them is such a such a massive point. I really appreciate that. I've got a, I've got a very basic question for you, though, Spencer, <laughs> right back to basics. Um, what is your definition of curiosity? So I define curiosity as the desire for new information that motivates exploration. Ah, it's right in the heart of ours as well, which is, we think, an attitude of wonder and a spirit of exploration. Yeah. I want to say I love your article in HBR last year on Marvel, the Marvel's blockbuster machine, 
Uh, not yeah. least because I'm a huge Marvel fan, as is my son. And through lockdown, I think we've consumed probably far too much Marvel uh, media. But what, what are you curious about? And, and maybe could you just share uh, why, are, why are Marvel so good at stimulating curiosity? Well, it, it's funny that you mentioned Marvel because I was actually just reading about Marvel um, as well today as kind of a follow on to that research. So, you know, Marvel hasn't had a movie in the theaters for the entire year. And yet at this moment that we're talking, they have sort of a stranglehold on pop culture because of WandaVision playing on Disney+. Plus. And the reason why I've been interested in that is that WandaVision does exactly what we describe the film's doing. It takes what we would think of as the Marvel template, but then it, it violates that template in some really fundamental ways that make the audience curious and make them want to engage with what they're doing. It builds this sort of community where people are testing ideas and hypotheses. Who do you think the real bad person is? Why did they use this sort of format? What is gonna be revealed in the next episode? And what's interesting about that is they've basically taken kind of, you know, uh, digital platforms for television and movies like Netflix and Disney Plus, which have traditionally released everything at once. And they've allowed it to go back to a traditional model of television where we're going to kind of slow roll this week by week. And yet it's been very successful in sustaining people's curiosity because not only does each episode have a little bit of a mystery to it, but it violates your expectations of what a Marvel movie should be. It's definitely not a movie about you know, a, a housewife and a husband in a black and white 1950s sitcom. And yet they've been able to do that in a really successful way. So one of the things that, that I am kind of really curious about is how organizations can begin to think about sustaining innovation as a way of thinking about how does my new innovation relate to my past innovation while also creating space for itself and creating space for future innovations. And I think that that's what Marvel has done such a marvelous job at, is, is doing what we like to call creating a zone of acceptable violations, in the sense that each new product creates curiosity by violating my expectations about what a product from this vendor looks like, so that then the next product even has more bandwidth for being something different as well. And I think Marvel's been amazing at that. Um, but, but recently I've spoken with CEOs from a variety of different industries that are trying to do the exact same thing, whether they're in the hotel business, as I mentioned, the banking industry, um, the outdoor sports industry, and people are kind of looking at Marvel and saying, how can we be like Marvel? How can we begin to think about our products rather as like a linear sequence of iPhone one, iPhone two, iPhone three to a universe of different things that relate to each other, but also violate their expectations around what an innovation from us looks like so that we have more space to do new things in the future. And what's cool about that is that has a reciprocal effect inside organizations because it allows the people that are actually generating these new ideas to have creative freedom and psychological safety for them to try things out and, and to fail and to experiment and to try new things. Right. And with Disney Plus, what a success, right? Oh, yeah, Massively amazing, Massively right? exceeded their expectations in terms of subscribers and impact on their share price, you know, throughout a pandemic. Yeah. yeah. So we're nearly at time. Um, just one closing question for you, Spencer. So what would be the one thing that our listeners should take away from uh, all of the fascinating areas that we've covered today? Well, I mean, I think I think there's obviously a lot of different takeaways. Um and clearly, as, as you know, us as individuals interested in curiosity, our curiosity kind of drives us in all of these different directions. But I think the one thing that I would hope business leaders can hear and take away is that there is a huge role for curiosity in business. It's not just something that's nice to have. It's something that's critical. And if you don't think it's critical today and you don't invest in it today, you'll find out that it will be critical tomorrow when you're having to close up your shop. And... On top of that, it's not just because it allows you to sustain, you know, your growth or your strategic direction or all of these other good things that are really great and bring, you know, wealth and money to people, but that it, at its most innate level, I think curiosity is about being a human. And that was kind of the reason for us wanting to call it a superpower is that it felt like it was something that was innately human. And the more we learn about curiosity, the more that we learn that engaging with things because we're curious sustains our humanity, both for us individually, in terms of allowing us to thrive and feel a sense of vitality, 
with the work that we're doing, but also as we interact with each other and as we build organizations, it allows us to create forums where we can be humans with each other. And I think that that's more and more important in a world where very often we just see each other through a screen and we don't actually get that interaction to know that the person on the other side is wanting to engage with me because they're truly curious sends a signal that I'm engaging with another human being rather than just a monitor. What a fantastic way for us to finish that it uh, can sustain our humanity, help our vitality, uh, but also that it's uh, so critical for uh, our businesses to invest in as well. Thank you so much for joining us, Spencer. Uh, It's been great talking to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you. Wonderful. It was an honor. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Curious Advantage podcast. The Curious Advantage book is now available to purchase on Amazon. Stay tuned for the next episode and keep exploring curiously. This podcast is produced by Aliki Palinelli and John McGinty and edited by Jill Damatak-Futter.